Hello, um, I'm Dr. Paul Cross, a consultant cellular pathologist based at Gateshead in the United Kingdom, and I'm going to talk in this session on the role of intraoperative consultation in patient management. What I'm going to cover within the context of the talk is what is an intraoperative consultation, how can it be done, how good is it, what are its uses and its limitations. Well, first of all, what is an intraoperative consultation? Well, it's basically a sample taken at surgery, which is looked at pathologically and the result given back to the surgeon. It can only be done and is only should, should only be done if it's going to affect the patient management in real time, i.e. when the surgeon is operating. If it's not going to affect what the surgeon does to the patient, then a frozen section at that time is not essential. The advantage of the intraoperative consultation is it allows the surgeon to know what they're dealing with. However, it does require trained pathology staff, very good and clear communication between the pathologist and the surgeon. As I say, it's only a value if it's going to affect what the surgeon does, and it is very different to routine surgical pathology tissue handling. I know many a pathologist who's very happy dealing with normal paraffin fixed, uh, formerly embedded paraffin fixed sections, but is far more reticent to involve themselves with a frozen section because of the differences, but I'll come into that later on and, and how we can possibly get around them. So just to, to say again, what is an intraoperative consultation, but why is it done? Well, the main reasons for an intraoperative consultation is a diagnosis of benign versus malignant. On many occasions, a surgeon may not know what they are dealing with and needs to know, is this a benign lesion that I can excise and potentially do no more? Or is it a malignant lesion, which means I should do a full staging procedure or be more radical in my approach or may require full staging? In obviously extreme cases, it may be confirmation so that this actually um, no major surgery is undertaken given the condition of the patient. It can also be used as a replacement for formalin fixed paraffin embedded FFPE histology, i.e. what would be termed normal hist histological processing. In some parts of the world, it is done to obviate the need for the expensive um, equipment for FFPE histology uh, processing. It's also of use in interoperative consultation for margins of a lesion. Is the lesion excised or not? It can be used for tissue identification. Has the surgeon got the right piece of tissue but needs to know at the time so they can go back and take other tissue if needs be? Frozen section material can also be used for certain other investigations, such as immunofluorescence or some of the muscle or perhaps neural or metabolic studies, but they are perhaps less common in general terms. So if we're talking about the types of tissue processing, I've mentioned about formally fixed paraffin embedded FFPE. And I'll use the acronym FFPE or FS frozen section throughout this talk just to save on space. FFPE is often referred to as routine histological processing, and this is where it takes typically 24 to 48 hours for the laboratory to process from receipt. And that is because it takes that time to fix in formalin, typically 24 hours, and then be processed overnight through varying degrees of strength of alcohol to be then allowed to be processed, embedded in paraffin wax, sections cut, stained, and presented for reporting down a microscope. Frozen section, basically does not do any of those steps. It uses a tissue approach where the tissue is frozen rapidly and then sectioned. So instead of making the tissue firm by processing in the normal way, it makes the tissue firm by freezing it. And because of that, the tissue uh, processing can be as minimal 20 to 30 minutes from receipt. It can be quicker, depends on the size of the sample, uh, the number of sections that may need taken, or perhaps the size of the lesion, the number of blocks taken. Cytology can also be used as an intraoperative consultation process, probably less commonly than a frozen section, but requires less equipment than a frozen section and is quicker. However, because it's a cytological approach, this is not always favoured by a lot of pathologists because it relies far more, far more on cytomorphological skills than histomorphological skills. So what are the indications for a frozen section in general terms? Well, as I've said, it's to provide rapid, gross or microscopic diagnosis to allow for an accurate diagnosis of a pathological process. It's to look at margins, identify metastases, or just identify tissue. It's got to be done to provide 
appropriate and accurate diagnosis, but also it's got to adhere to a specific protocol as to what to do under those circumstances. If the surgeon's going to get an answer which he then ignores or does not act on, then that is no point in doing the test. It also allows tissue to be taken for research and special study protocols, um, and many a, a, a tissue bank can be developed on the basis of tissue taken at the time of a frozen section. It can be used, as I say, in place of permanent, permanent processing, but this is, depends very much on the infrastructure. Certainly would not advocate a frozen section if there's no immediate implication for decision making, uh, or if the tissue is for permanent processing, i.e. is a unique or small piece of tissue that can only be taken once. And paraffin, formalin, uh, formalin fixed paraffin embedded material invariably will give a more robust diagnostic answer that can usually have more special stains or other tests applied to it. Certainly would consider not doing a frozen section. If, if we know it's going to produce severe artifacts that will hinder interpretation and potentially lead to a misdiagnosis, if it's heavily calcified or ossified material that you cannot possibly section, and if there's a serious risk of infection, and that would cover the easily transmissible conditions of HIV, TB, hepatitis, but also COVID in the current climate. If the tissue is very fatty, again, it is very difficult to get a good frozen section. Again, with skill and practice, it is possible, but there is certainly no guarantee. So if we look at frozen sections, well, the key piece of equipment for a frozen section is a cryostat. This is a dedicated machine which allows frozen section processing. It must be kept at minus 10 to minus 20 degrees Celsius, uh, or at least in that area of uh, degree of coldness. And it consists of various aspects, which I'll show in slightly greater detail later on. A cooling chamber, which allows the tissue to cool. Um, it may involve a Peltier device, which can be used to chill the chucks on which the tissue is processed a microtome for tissue sectioning, and an anti-roll bar and tissue sectioning area, which allows you to extract the tissue section onto a glass slide to allow for staining and examination. There are many different types and models of uh, cryostat available on the market, and there are numerous videos, if you get a look on YouTube or on commercial websites, which will give you very much more technical detail than I'm going to give you, but will show you the different models, how to be, how they can be used, and pros and cons, as well as some good tips on how to do frozen sections. There are, there are full size cryostats, but there are also bench size or bench top cryostats. So depending on your infrastructure, these may be applicable. If you're going to do regular cryostat, re regular frozen sections, then probably a larger piece of kit is more dependable than the smaller one. However, must be borne in mind that we are dealing with fresh, although frozen, fresh tissue, and there is always a risk of infection. So the cryostat must be decontaminated frequently. Now that will, of course, take the equipment out of service whilst that's being done. So it is important to make sure that that is not done when you may be doing a frozen section or one may be asked for, otherwise it may interfere with your ability to offer that service. So if we go through the sorts of steps involved in frozen sectioning and what should be done. Well, one of the most important things from experience is identifying that you've got a sample. In my own laboratory, we use visual, man visual management process where we use a bright yellow form. All the other histology requests are on white paper or a white uh, printed paper. So a bright yellow form stands out against all the other samples. So if a frozen section arrives in our laboratory, we can easily identify it. And this is important because whilst a frozen section should be pre-booked and the surgeon has, has informed the pathologist of what they are intending, the details of the patient, what the sample should be and the question to be asked, it is important that uh, the that, that is arranged ideally a day before. However, surgeons are notorious at changing their minds and forgetting to cancel or forgetting to book. Hence the use of the yellow form, if one were to arrive, is easily identifiable and the following sort of lean process. This is a typical sort of ovary that we get in my own laboratory for frozen section. As you can see, it's a large lesion of the order of 30 centimeters. And not only is the first step to, to gross that, i.e. measure it in three dimensions, we weigh these lesions, but to identify any obvious abnormality, important with ovarian lesions, particularly cystic lesions, as to whether there's leakage or rupture, which may be preoperative or intraoperative, but it's important to identify that for the risk of potential spillage or spread.
and that goes for any frozen section which is of large size. If it's a small biopsy frozen section, such as a two to three millimeter biopsy, then that's a different approach. Obviously, the ovary must then be opened, or the lesion, I should say, the sample must be opened and inspected so that you can try and identify tissue area for sampling. And this is critical to frozen sectioning, and I'll come on to that more in later. Here we have a frozen section block that has been taken from this lesion. It's about the size of a thumbnail, so roughly a centimeter or so in size and a couple of millimeters thick. It must not overhang the, cry the cryostat chuck. It should be within the central area. The reason for that is if it is too big or has variable tissue within it, such as fatty and firm or necrotic and firm, it will freeze at differential rates and will be difficult to freeze and they're cut, therefore cut. So it's important that the, the block is not too big. Pathologists do like taking as big a piece of tissue as they can. Once the block is taken and it's put on, some, on a mountain such as DPX, you can see the liquid there, which binds the section to the chuck to a degree, it can be frozen. Now, in this particular one, we're using a fray freeze here, a uh, spray freeze here, I should say, but there are other methods which I'll come into in a few minutes. Once the tissue is frozen and the chuck is at suitable temperature, it can then be inserted into the microtome chuck so that actually the blade, which will be here, can be used to section the block to produce a ribbon and therefore the section. You can see the roll bar here, it has yet to be inserted. And if we look at that in slightly more detail in another cryostat, here we have the chuck, which is very frozen. Here we have the blade. So the chuck is advanced against the blade, can be a manual rotary system, or it can be um, electric, where it advances at preset distances. That allows six sections to be cut once the full face is exposed. And that section can therefore be taken through under the roll bar to actually be teased off and put on a glass slide for sectioning. Notice here we have the other chucks which are being frozen. There's a lot of frozen sections in there for some reason. Um, and it's important if you have multiple frozen sections to identify which chuck is which piece of tissue from which site, particularly if you have more than one site as a frozen section at the time or more than one sample from more than one patient at the same time. And if we go here, we can see the ribbon being cut and teased out. Here we have a section being teased out with a brush onto the roll bar, teased out, which can then be placed on the glass slide and stained. Here we see the slide being hand stained and frozen sections would invariably be hand stained. There is no time to put this on an automated process and it's easily enough just to go through the jars of the various um, alcohols and H&E to produce a good quality H&E section, which can then be cover slipped and is of that available for examination down the microscope. As I say, this takes typically probably 15 to 20 minutes from receipt to sectioning and preparation, and then five to 10 minutes to actually look at down the microscope and contact the surgeon to give your report. So general points, as I've touched on again, but bear iteration. If there's a high risk of infection, then really frozen sectioning should be considered, is it necessary? Tissue cytology or touch print cytology may be more appropriate as it minimizes the risk of aerosol spread and, and infection and can be done within an enclosed category three type hood, therefore minimizing infection to all, all involved. As I've said, if it's heavily calcified or ossified, you cannot cut it. You need to decalcify or look for a softer tissue area. If it's fatty, Fat does not freeze well. It tends to explode and you can't get a decent section. So fatty tissue, soft tissue for things like query sarcoma or a margin on a soft tissue lesion can be very problematic. And again, it should be considered whether this is actually a good technique to use. And again, if it isn't going to affect the surgery, why are you doing it? The tissue should be of the order of a thumbnail in size and a couple of millimeters in thickness at most. As I've said, the bigger the size, the greater the chance it won't freeze, the greater the chance it won't cut, the greater the, the, greater the chance you'll have a poor section. And poor sections mean probably uh, difficulty in diagnosing and potentially a wrong answer. It is critical for tissue sampling. 
you need to get the right area to sample. And this is very key, particularly with large lesions, as I'll come on to later, as to which bit do you take. The reason for that is if you take the wrong bit, you may get the wrong answer. So you need to take the most representative bit that will give you the diagnosis that will allow the surgeon to act appropriately. It's very easy to get to take a wrong uh, piece of tissue and therefore give an erroneous, although correct answer at that time. So what are the problems with frozen sections in, in technical and diagnostic terms? Well, as I've said, poor site selection by the surgeon. The surgeon may have sent the wrong piece of tissue to the pathologist. I've known many, well, many, certainly several occasions where there is a great big large tumour, but the surgeon for some reason takes a very small biopsy from another site rather than send the primary tumour. The surgeon is actually looking potentially for spread rather than what is the diagnosis. Now, really, you need to know what is the lesion rather than spread. That's a secondary question. So it depends on what is being asked. Is this a diagnosis of malignancy or, or benign, or is this a tumour that may have spread? Because whilst the biopsy from say peritoneum may be negative, it may still be a primary tumour from somewhere. As I say, poor site selection by the pathologist may lead to an erroneous answer and the larger the sample, the more the, the greater the risk for that. If the lesion is extensively necrotic or degenerate, then again, it's very easy to take a piece of tissue that would not give an answer. So you must get viable tissue. The other problem is very focal disease. If you have a large lesion, but the pathology is only focal within it, then again, a wrong sample can give to a wrong diagnosis. Technical problems, again, relate really to the freezing and the cutting uh, process. As I've said, too thick a section to uh, the wrong type of material will lead to very marked freezing or staining artifact, poor quality tissue. Air drying is very important because, of course, there's no formal fixation here and poor staining. Interpretational errors can lead to significant clinical mismanagement. Obviously, a difficult to diagnose lesion. If it is difficult, how are we going to arrive at that diagnosis? If there's lots of lesional heterogeneity, how are we going to know we've got the right bit? We can easily give a wrong diagnosis or an assessment, and it does look different to a formally infixed paraffin embedded section. And hence, many uh, pathologists are reticent about looking at frozen section material. Um, some data here from UK Nequest CPT, who offer a technical frozen section evaluation service for quality um, assessment. If we look at the range of problems and comments relating to poor marks within the scheme, the vast majority relate to the cryotomy, i.e. the sectioning and freezing aspect, or to the staining aspect. So this is a very technical um, set of, uh, area and a lot of those problems can be offset by good frozen section technique. Not all of them, because it depends very much on the tissue sample as well. And if we look at in greater de detail to the average score on this right hand column, in, in their experience, and this will vary, the best average score for the frozen sections relates to the use of the Peltier device, which pre um, cools the chuck prior to use. So a pre-cooled chuck allows the tissue to freeze quicker and the tissue to adhere to that chuck. Other methods give varying degrees of scoring and are probably therefore inferior techniques in their experience. Section tissue section, their optimum is six to eight mi uh, microns for tissue sectioning. Um, again, that's important because the average histological section is of the order of three to five mu. So the tissue section in a frozen section is a lot thicker and that gives a far more three dimensional aspect than you see on a paraffin, a formal fixed paraffin embedded um, section. The vast majority of frozen sections in their scheme are manually stained. Very few are automated, um, although it may give a better score. It adds time in my experience and there is a critical trade off between the time for diagnosis to be back to the surgeon because all the time the surgeon may be waiting for that result to act appropriately and the patient may well be under general anaesthetic with the risks that that involves. So if we look at examples of poor frozen sections, 
here we have a low power view of a frozen section which is incredibly torn, shattered, ribboned, and there is no coherent morphology there. At higher power, it's difficult to see architecture. It is so torn and fragmented that inherent architecture there is difficult to discern. Cytology may be possible, but not necessarily the full architecture. The other point to make is the frozen section, of course, is not formal and fixed, therefore has a far more air dried appearance. So the tissue section here of uh, frozen versus paraffin from a similar area looks different. This looks more air dried, therefore the cytology and the cell size is bigger, paler, looks more uh, threatening to the pathologist and the section is thicker. So you get a more three dimensionality to the section than you do with a f an FFPE section. Again, it is a perfectly, uh, it is a skill which is perfectly easily able to be identified and trained for, but it's a different way of reporting. None of us are born to report FFPE sections, we learn it. The same can be done with frozen sections, and it, but it just needs good exposure and good education. So how good are frozen sections in the intraoperative consultation setting? Well, it depends on many variables, as I said, tissue site, sampling, and if it's a large specimen, how and what you sample. And this is the iceberg principle. We may be sampling this and forgetting about this. So we may sample one or two centimetres of a lesion that may be 30 centimetres in diameter. How do we know that what we are sampling is representative of the whole lesion? And that comes down to very good tissue sample site selection. It also depends on the level of diagnosis required, i.e. are we looking for a diagnosis of benign versus malignant, which often can be offered? Is it down to what is this lesion, which is more problematic? Is it down to what grade is this tumour, which again is more problematic? And I think the, the, I'll come into reporting later, but the basic principle of frozen section is around, is it benign or is it malignant? That's the thrust of a frozen section reporting, or is a margin involved or clear? So that depends, as I've said, on these parameters, but also on the quality of the frozen section and the expertise, it must be said, of the reporting pathologist. So how good are frozen sections? In this paper, going back a few years, I accept, but very typical of the literature, but this is a very good large study from the Mayo Clinic Rochester in the States. But basically, on their example, where they do a lot of frozen section reporting uh, as, as a holding um, diagnostic uh, category for the surgeon at the time, compared to the final histological FFPE sections, accuracy of just under 98%, with a revision of diagnosis in just over 2%. And of those, 1.6 of that 2.2%, to 1.6% overall, were unavoidable sampling areas, areas i.e. very large lesion, and you're unlucky. 5% were relative changes of abnormality, so probably would not affect um, clinical management um, directly and a very low percentage, 0.1, with clinical significance and would have affected patient management. So in general terms, a frozen section report across a variety of tissue sites, and it does vary by site and type of reporting, is a very effective process, as long as you have good quality sampling, good quality sectioning and processing, and good quality reporting. So how do you report your intraoperative consultation? Well, as I've said, in general terms, it's usually benign versus malignant. And in terms of margins, that is negative versus positive. However, the third category is usually called defer, which either boils down to don't know or not certain. And this is a legitimate answer. We can't guess in the situation of a frozen section, we must be certain. So if you cannot be certain it is benign or malignant or negative or positive, you can't give an answer. You can indicate to the surgeon a level of probability or a level of certainty perhaps, but it may not be 100%. And this is where you've got to use very clear, concise language between the reporting pathologist and the surgical team or the surgeon you're giving that answer to. I would always advocate the, the report is given to this member of the surgical team. I would not, I do not like going through theatre staff or other grades of staff, largely because they're not dealing with the patient themselves directly, and you may get distortion of the message. 
I would always advocate you would record exactly what you have said, either in your request form or somewhere uh, in your laboratory system, computer, paper, whatever, because it's important that you know what you said, uh, particularly a week or two later, you may not recall. And always audit where possible against outcomes. Ideally, that would be against final histology where possible, but also against any other outcomes that are uh, attainable because you need to know how good your reporting is. So that's about frozen sections, and that is the most commonly used intraoperative consultative technique. If we look at intraoperative cytology, which is another option to intraoperative frozen section. Well, intraoperative cytology is attractive because it's usually a quicker process, and this is a sort of approach where whatever the lesion is, if it's a large lesion, then this approach is applicable. If it's a small biopsy, then yes, you can do it, but really it's not suitable. This is really for large excisions of larger lesions, where basically you cut away, having described the lesion, you cut it, you uh, get rid of excess blood and fluid, which will get in the way, and you can either do a scrape cytology or you can do a touch imprint. You then uh, do a diff quick stain or whichever stain you, you prefer, but again, that can be rapidly done. It is then rinsed, stained, and cover slipped, and given to re the reporting pathologist. That is a quicker process. And in sort of um, appearance terms, again, your macros, mac uh, doing a macro on the specimen, examining it, identifying the area for your cytology, doing either a, a spread or a scrape, and then staining. So the advantage of this is it can be done inside a, a tissue uh, cabinet, minimizing potential infection. So from the point of view of infection risk, this is a safer pr process than a frozen section, which invariably has to be done on, a, on an open bench, ideally with a laminar flow approach. Again, just to reiterate, hand staining, rapid, we use diff kit, diff quick, commercial diff quick, works fine. Uh, you can produce um, a very good staining on this basis. So how good is intraoperative cytology? Well, again, the literature perhaps isn't as extensive in some ways, but this recent paper, um, actually from Iran, if I remember, uh, yeah, uh, talks about its use in head and neck tumour, touch print, imprint or crush against final outcome. They got an 84% roughly accuracy for malignancy with sensitivity and specificity perfectly respectable and they're also tumour typing. Now, they did a range of sites, lymph nodes, oral malignancies and other lesions, the lymph nodes were for metastatic spread. And certainly for the diagnosis of an epithelial tumour, cytology, touch print or whatever, is effective. Certainly for lymphomas, and I would also say this for frozen section, for, for diagnosis of possible lymphoma, I don't think this is a good technique because it's difficult to know what it is. You may be able to diagnose it as a high-grade tumour, but you may not be able to classify it as epithelial versus, versus non-epithelial, um, such as a lymphoma or even a sarcoma. So again, with experience, it is possible but if the question is query lymphoma, then I wouldn't necessarily advocate frozen section or touch print cytology. So what I'm going to give now is some examples of where intraoperative consultation can be used. And it gets back to what is being asked. Are we asked for a diagnosis of what is it? Are we being asked for a diagnosis of what is it? And can we help with further information, be it grading, staging, or primary versus metastatic disease? Are we looking at margins or are we looking for non-malignant other um, conditions which frozen section or touch print cytology arguably may be able to help with? So I'll try and give a couple of examples just as flavours. As I said before, my uh, main experience is with adult ovarian frozen sections and with the um, ex diagnosis of ovarian frozen sections peroperatively. This is a typical sort of lesion that we get where you get a large lesion, it's intact, there's abnormal papillary looking areas on the surface, it's multiloculated. You section it and you see obvious mucin, but where do you sample? Well, most of the time you want to, you want to section solid areas or areas of intersections of locules. It has to ideally look viable and not necrotic. That having said that, it is difficult on occasions to get a viable frozen section and I fully appreciate the difficulties involved, but you wouldn't sample the mucin. You wouldn't sample necessarily just an area of extra extraneous tissue on the surface, perhaps, but you would tissue perhaps the solid area, sample the tissue, solid area such as that. So if we look at the literature 
figures, and this is typical literature review, including our own study, our own paper from the bottom, of against diagnoses. Well, most of the time you want benign versus malignant. And the sensitivity and specificity ranges from 100 down in most papers to the lower 90s. This particular case um, of 97.2 and 95 are relatively low, ours 95.6. So it depends on the range of tumours you get and the sampling. Having said that, in management terms, it does mean that over 96% of the time, you're getting specificity of roughly 96% and sensitivity of nearly 100%. So it is a technique that across the board in the literature works very well in the setting of adult ovarian tumours. And if we look at that in a effectively a two by two table, a benign, which is the paraffin section reports versus the frozen section reports of benign, frozen versus benign final diagnosis paraffin and malignant versus malignant. Borderline, as you may well be aware, is really the category of in situ change of pre-malignant, but would be managed clinically in the same way as an invasive tumour. So hence, for management terms, we put the two together because they would be managed by staging at the time of surgery. So effectively, we've got in this study of, nearly, of over two and a half thousand uh, frozen sections of frozen section cases, the vast majority of the time we get benign right, we get malignant right. The ones where we've got it wrong over and under interpretation are relatively uncommon, but obviously could be of clinical significance. Again, a busy slide with a lot of statistics and I apologize, but if we look at the, the number of times we call it benign and it's benign is 90%. Our conversion rate of benign to malignant is just over 2% and borderline is nearly not, just over 9%. Borderline can be very focal. So that is a sampling issue in general terms. If we look at the number of times malignant is correct on paraffin and frozen, 99%. If we include borderline in that, it's over 99%. The advantage of this sort of data is this helps give the, conf the confidence to the surgeon that the technique will work, but also allows the patient to have an informed view as to whether they wish the surgeon to uh, perform a frozen section or a weight paraffin section in our setting. It is important that the patient is given information to allow them to make an informed consent, because otherwise um, you're doing th something to them without their full knowledge. The other important point here is the defer rate, which is here, which is under half a percent. And by defer, it's those examples in this particular setting with ovarian adult tissue where we were unable to offer a dis definite diagnosis. The other thing, which is not on this table, is that it we're able quite often to offer an opinion as to whether it's a primary ovarian tumour or potentially a secondary tumour. And in the setting of an ovary, Common sites for secondary tumours are from breast or colorectal. Other sites are on occasion uh, and GI, including appendix. So it is useful for the surgeon, if you indicate, I think this looks like a secondary, to look at, say, the bowel in particular for potential primary. So with experience, that can be added onto the basic benign versus malignant approach. And the only point in offering any of this service is to allow the surgeon to do a staging procedure, because if it is limited uh, to the um, ovary, then we wouldn't be staging. Uh, if it is extensive, then the uh, if it's potential for spread, then the surgeon can do staging at that time. So we offer a frozen section ideally for stage one or two early stage so that the surgeon can then stage for that. If it's disseminated stage three or four, there's little point in offering a frozen section apart from potentially diagnosis of malignancy and arguably site of origin. Another example where frozen section is used is for assessment of endometrial adenocarcinoma in two particular aspects. One is depth of invasion into the myometrium, be it less or greater than 50%, but also grade. And the reason for that is that in many centres, if at the time of surgery, there's a grade one or two, a FIGO grade one or two endometrioid endometrial adenocarcinoma with depth of invasion of less than 50% or a small tumour, 
less than two centimeters, they would offer simple hysterectomy. If it's greater than that or a higher grade, they would then offer lymphadenectomy also. Now, this involves receiving the uterus and attempting a grade and depth of invasion at the time. Now, the literature, and this is one, one paper, indicates that this can be done and the intraoperative report versus the permanent can offer a good um, agreement. There will not always be total agreement given the nature of, of the focality of tumour change potentially, but also with the depth of invasion. Now, again, this is not offered in all centres, but it's just an example of where a frozen section um, process can be used to aid management. Now, again, in this particular paper, the grading accuracy of intraoperative versus FFPE is of the order of 95% for grading and 92% for invasion. So it's not 100%, but it is of use in guiding the surgeon. But again, the surgeon and the patient will be informed by that data to know the level of accuracy and arguably inaccuracy. Again, if we look at this example here, we have a large ovarian lesion. It could be subjected to frozen section, but touch print cytology offers a very good diagnostic tool. And here we have large sheets from a uh, mucinous tumour with mucin in the background. Here we have another lesion, the frozen section, which is a clear cell carcinoma, shown by the large hobnailed pale cytoplasm. can often look deceptively bland at frozen section, but the cytology is classic sheets with uh, variable high-grade nuclei with a non-mucinous type background invariably of clear cell carcinoma. So the cytology and the frozen section morphology should agree. And the easy way to get the agreement with the two and learning experience is to do the two at the same time. A good example of margin use for frozen section reporting is Mohs surgery for skin uh, carcinoma, typically of the, of the face or head and neck, where usually the diagnosis is known, squamous carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma, although it can be done at the time of surgery, and it's allow the, sur the, the surgeon, when he's removing the lesion, to know if they've got clearance, both at the skin and deep aspect. The reason for that is they don't want to necessarily go back and they may have to do a graft or a, clo or a primary closure. So by knowing at the time of surgery they've removed the whole lesion allows them to do a, sw a single procedure excision. Now, with the Mohs surgery, 100% of the margins will be looked at at frozen section. And depending on your protocol, uh, it would all be it would be inked and examined under frozen section. So you can you can produce multiple sections here at frozen section. So it can be time consuming. But again, is of great value to the surgeon and the patient in trying to get clearance. And again, with Mohs surgery and good, good material and good um, reporting, you can get cure rates of 99% based on good primary clearance. Normal tissue identification is another example of where frozen sections can be used. And this is when you need to identify tissue at operation. There are as many examples of this. One is parathyroid surgery, where the surgeon needs to know has he excised potentially a parathyroid, parathyroid hyperplasia or a parathyroid adenoma. And it can be difficult to identify that, particularly if there's a multinodular goiter or potentially a lymph node. So confirmation of have I got the right tissue, you're not necessarily looking for the diagnosis of adenoma versus hyperplasia versus carcinoma, but it, it is of diagnosis of the tissue. Hirschsprung's is also another procedure, which I'll come into slightly more detail in a moment, but it allows the surgeon to know he's got the correct tissue. If not, they may need to go back. And obviously that tissue may be normal or abnormal, but it's got to be recognisable as that site to know that the surgeon's got the right tissue that you can offer an opinion on. Obviously in Hirschsprung's disease, whilst it may be able to be diagnosed uh, before op uh, operation, but on a single mucosal biopsy, at any uh, excisional treatment where they're doing excisional uh, a partial colectomy or a seg segmentectomy, they need to know if they've got clearance and back into a ganglionic section. They mean, may need to know if there's ganglion cells present at the margins of the specimen. Uh, and that can require uh, mucosal biopsying for frozen sectioning. And that may require an H&E section or it could require other stains for nerve, uh, for ident identification of nerves.
not commonly done, tends to be in paediatric centres, but of course is a potential use of frozen sectioning um, in this context. Again, how good is it? Well, again, the literature, um, and this is one paper which is typical of the literature, on their frozen section versus final definitive diagnosis, they got a sensitivity of 86% roughly, specificity of 90%. There is a false positive and negative rate. Now that, as they identified, can be due to poor tissue handling and sampling, but also interpretational error. But it also also be borne in mind, if you have a short segment Hirschsprungs, it can be very difficult to identify at the time of surgery. And that's very much down to sampling, which is difficult if you're getting a large length of bowel. So it's inherent in what is being done. So in conclusion, intraoperative pathology reporting can be of great value to patient diagnosis and management. However, its use must be defined and agreed between the pathologist and the surgeon. This is not something to be sprung on a pathologist by a surgeon without discussion, ideally before and during. It does have issues as a process, and it's got to be acknowledged by both the patient, sorry, by, by the pathologist and the surgeon, but also the patient. The patient must be aware that no histology reporting, no cytology reporting is absolutely 100%. And the error rate in frozen sectioning is going to be greater than that with definitive paraffin section, but is still a reliable technique under these circumstances. If it's used properly, it's very effective. So I've said it's not as good as FFPE, but it's very comparable. And you've got to always audit the service and the outcomes. You must never, oh, at least on every opportunity, you must always correlate and audit. You've got to know whether the technical quality and the reporting is correct. And that gets down to education of both the laboratory technical staff and the pathologist about what they are doing and how they're offering that service. Thank you for listening.